uh, where the idea of sequence data is, uh, is you know, what's primary and important. And then the metadata is just additional information that tells you, uh, you know, what the context is for where those sequences come from and what you can do with them. But uh, increasingly, as sequencing gets cheaper and cheaper, and it becomes more and more feasible to collect the sequences, uh, the, sequence, uh, the sequence data just becomes one more kind of data that you would add to a study, rather than being uh, rather than being unique and special. And I think we're really starting to see the shift where uh, where now sequence data is one thing that you add as a component of a study, rather than being something that's different in nature from the rest of the uh, from the rest of the information in the experimental design. Rob, can you project a little bit stronger? Oh, uh, is, is the microphone <coughs> not? Um, now that's better. Okay, let me move that up there. Is that better? Yes. Okay, so, um, so, so the issue really is, uh, you know, science without metadata gives you results that are very hard to, to interpret. And, uh, for example, in the 19th century, uh, you know, you'd have, uh, and before, you'd have these curio cabinets where you just have a bunch of uh, objects collected from all over the place without any, systemati uh, system uh, uh, without any systematic labeling or uh, any detailed description of where they come from, right? And so it's very difficult uh, to interpret if you just have a collection of sequences and a collection of studies uh, that are all mixed in together where uh, all, all you know is that you got them from some source and you don't really know what that source is. And uh, this is especially true was um, sequencing and the analysis of samples uh, moves from kind of the cottage industry uh, to, to like an actual industry, right? So a lot of us, um, a, a lot of us here at the meeting, uh, are starting to do things like using liquid handling robots to process uh, to process hundreds or thousands of samples at once. And um, when, when you when, when you start uh, when you start doing the sampling handling on this kind of industrial scale, uh, you start caring a lot more about uh, about these kinds of labeling issues. So, for example, from your grandma, you might be happy to uh, have something that's just got a hand scrawled label on it, but um, where uh, you know, based on where it is on the shelf, more or less what it is, right? But uh, that's not really going to work out in the supermarket, where you care about things like detailed information about what the content of each of the items is. Uh, you care about uh, you care about things like barcodes and systematic labeling, so that you can uh, so that you can trace the provenance of an item back to the back to the person who produced it, or the or, or the organisation that produced it. Um, and, and you care about a, a systematic and detailed uh, inventory of the contents so that you know a lot more about it than you might have done traditionally. Um, and uh, another, another thing I'll point out, a lot of the stuff I showed you yesterday was uh, using, using unsupervised, uh, un unsupervised classification techniques where uh, basically what you're doing is just taking, all the, uh, just taking all the sequences and then trying to look for intrinsic patterns in the data. Uh, but you might also want to do supervised classification, where basically what you're doing is uh, us using, using a set of samples with known category labels. Uh, you want to be able to figure out how to take new unlabeled samples and put them in the correct category. So this has been widely used for things like microarray analysis, where you want to uh, separate, say, cancer cells from non-cancer cells. Um, and, and basically the idea is that with principal coordinates analysis, what you're doing is you're trying to find a projection of the data that maximizes, uh, maximizes how, how spread out the data are intrinsically, right? But with, uh, with supervised classification, what you're doing is you have two sets of samples that you know are different from one another, and you're trying to find a, separa you're trying to find a separation that will maximize those differences between groups rather than maximizing the overall variability. So, um, so if, you take, if you take these two distributions for A and B, for example, um, if you did a principal coordinates analysis, you'd draw your main axis um, just spreading it out with A and B mixed together. But you could do a different view of the data, a different projection that will separate those groups from one another. And uh, especially having a large amount of information from, uh, for, from different sites already there in the database really allows you to, uh, really, uh, allows you to, uh, to do a lot more when you, when, you know for, when you know from the beginning that you expect to see group differences and you want to find out what those group differences are. Um, uh, another thing that's kind of cool is, uh, is, is that you can use this kind of thing to correct, um, uh, correct errors in labeling. So, um, so, so another, another big issue with larger studies is it's really easy to, uh, to, to have issues like something getting pipetted into the wrong well or uh, rows of samples swapped uh, in each other. Um, one, one time we even had uh, a 96 well plate that had just been put in the, uh, put in the liquid handling robot backwards, right? And so the results were very hard to interpret until we, uh, until we started to consider the possibility that maybe all of the samples were labeled differently from what they thought they would be. And uh, in, in that infant time series uh, I, I showed you yesterday, um, we got some initially puzzling results. Uh, that this, uh, so, so for example, we had these three time points um, at day 19, 55, and 85. 
uh, that looked up a lot like uh, like much later time points. And so, um, and so this was very puzzling. And when we, uh, when Ruth went back to the freezer, uh, back to the fecal specimens, and chiseled off another piece, and uh, re-extracted the DNA and uh, sent them through the uh, sent them through the processing pipeline and resequenced them, what happened was those three time points uh, fell exactly into the distribution that we expected from the overall pattern. Right. So it's always worth considering the possibility when you have a few unusual results. Uh, do I really believe these results, or do I think it was more likely that there was some technical issue? Uh, during the processing, where I might not believe the categories that are assigned, and um, and, and, and yesterday we, we, we heard a fair bit about trying to define uh, uh, trying to define core microbiota that apply across a set of environments. Um, one 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 thing we've run into in core uh, in core genome analysis, for example, uh, is is the problem where you just need a few items that are mislabeled, and you can draw really incorrect uh, conclusions about the core. So, uh, so one analysis we did with, uh, with Jeff Gordon's lab looking at whole bacterial genomes, um, the idea was to find what are the core genes that separate the firmicutes uh, from the bacteroidetes. And uh, the initial analysis indicated that there was nothing uh, that the bacteroidetes and the firmicutes two completely different bacterial phyla, uh, that there was nothing that was unique to, uh, to one lineage or the other. So, uh, so we did some network analysis of exactly uh, which genome was connected to which other genome and which genes connected them. And it turned out that essentially all of the connections came from, uh, came from one member of the bacteroidetes, uh, which looked a whole lot like a firmicute. And the reason for that is that it actually was a firmicute. Uh, it had been misclassified taxonomically <laughs> in the 1960s, right? And, uh, and, and, so, um, and so when you got the whole genome, you could tell what it was really supposed to be, whereas, uh, you, uh, whereas from the growth conditions and the morphological characteristics um, uh, uh, and, and the biochemical characteristics, it was relatively easy to misclassify it. And so, so it's always worth wondering: um, could, could there be a problem? Uh, you know, could, could there be a problem with how things are labelled? And uh, you know, could I could I correct that problem? So, um, so, so another another piece of work uh, done by Dan Knights uh, in, um, last last year in my lab is uh, is, is just uh, just basically asking if you have their overall trend and you have a few samples that don't match that trend. Um, should you uh, should you trust that overall trend, um, or should you uh, should you trust the asserted labels? And so basically, the technique here is to use supervised machine learning, where what you have to do is train a model uh, on, on the overall trend of the data, and then ask uh, for the outliers. Should I correct those outliers to some other category? And um, and, and so, for example, on the uh, on the keyboard task, uh, so that was the data set I showed you yesterday with the fingertips of the keyboard. Um, uh, what, uh, what what Dan did is basically uh, basically randomly introduced labeling errors, uh, and then used a random forest classifier trained on the assumption that there would be three different individuals um, to ask what would happen if you just corrected those labels. And amazingly, uh, even 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 when about half the samples were intentionally mislabeled, so um, so so randomly switched between the subject they were supposed to be uh, and the other two subjects. Uh, what, what happens is that after label correction, um, you, what, what you can see is all these circled uh, incorrect labels. Um, after label correction, training the overall classifier, uh, almost all of them, that's just a couple of mistakes, almost all of them are corrected back to what they should be. Right? And, so, um, and so you can use this kind of strategy uh, to figure out whether it's more likely that you have individual, um, individual data points that are very surprising, uh, or whether it's more likely that you have a labeling error overall. Um, so, um, so, so this, this is just reminding you of uh, what, what the data set is, uh, the, the fingertips and the keys. And um, another, thing, uh, another thing that hasn't got a lot of attention so far, uh, but really should, um, is, is, this, uh, is, is, this issue of, uh, is, is this issue of effect size. And um, so one, one of the pieces of software that, uh, that, 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 um, that Antonio was working on at the moment uh, is, is this project called Evident, where, uh, where basically the idea is to ask uh, what, what is the effect size of different conditions, and then if you had fewer sequences or fewer samples, uh, would you still be able to find out uh, the, uh, what, what you found out in the, initial, um, in, in the initial project? And especially can we start applying data from one project um, to, to adequately statistically power other projects and figure out how many samples we need to look at, uh, how many sequences we need to collect, and so forth. So, um, so, so for example, if I take that keyboard study, uh, what, what, what I can do is, um, if, if, I, if I click the demo checkbox and click run, what it's going to do is it's going to recapture, uh, it's going to recapture um, what, we did in the, uh, what we did in the original study. And, um, yeah. What data is it pulling up right now? 
Oh, um, so, so this, this is going back to the, um, so, so this, is, this is going back to the uh, keyboard study. Uh, uh, so so it's, um, it's going back to the, uh, the OTU table, I and it's pulling counts out of the OTU table. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, did it disconnect me? It disconnected me. Great. Um, so I'll just connect, uh, let me just connect to the VPN and redo that. Um, Because it should be pretty fast. <coughs> yeah. So, so there we go. So, so this is um, so this is actually a, a, a new piece of viewing software that uh, Antonio is writing called um, called, called Emperor. Uh, so, so the the King Viewer uh, has very limited metadata handling capabilities. And the idea is to uh, is, is to uh, do this new software that uh, allows us to um, allows us to do that in more detail. So, so if we look if we look at the colors, for example, and I change that over to say, um, color them by host ID. Uh, what, what, what you can see is that with, with all the sequences, you get these, uh, these three very nice clusters for the, for the three hosts. Um, and uh, one, one, one I, uh, whereas, uh, whereas in contrast, if I color them according to, um, according to uh, what's, um, what, what's, the, what's the fingertip versus uh, what's the keyboard. So we have, um, so, so we have the segment in red versus, uh, versus the surface in blue. Uh, you can see that they're very well mixed together. And uh, one, one, one of the cool things, uh, one, one of the cool things about uh, about Evident is that it lets you do the visibility independently of the cover uh, of the coloring. So, for example, if I want to do something like um, determine the visibility by host subject, uh, I can say take uh, take off one of those individual people, right, uh, and, and then keep the coloring uh, keep the coloring for the keys versus fingertips, or vice versa. So it provides a lot of uh, it provides a lot of flexibility for exploratory data analysis. Um, so, so anyway, uh, so, so you might be wondering, well, what, what would happen if you had a different number of sequences per sample? So suppose, uh, so suppose we only had a couple of hundred sequences per sample. Uh, what would happen if we redid, uh, if, if we redid the analysis? And so what, what it's doing now is it's just pulling out a, um, so, so what it's doing now is it's just taking, uh, uh, going back and pulling out 225 sequences from each sample. Um, and uh, what, what you can see when we uh, rerun that is, um, is that uh, with a couple of hundred sequences per sample, um, the clustering by host isn't quite as nice, uh, but it's still, it's still pretty clearly separated for the, for the three individuals that we have. And then uh, if I crank that down, so we're only looking at say, um, so we're only looking at say 25 sequences per sample, and I rerun that. Um, so, so what, what you can see is that if you only have 25 sequences per sample, and I color that by uh, by host, uh, you can see that you really start to lose that that individual specific difference once you get down to that very low coverage, right? So what's so what what's so what's really nice about this is that you can um, so what's really nice about this is that from a from a data set that you've already collected, you can run these what if scenarios and ask uh, if if I have fewer sequences or um, or for example fewer fewer samples per subject. So if I take this down to having only, say, seven samples per subject, that I have a lot more sequences. So maybe, um, yes, so, so you can see it updates the number. As, as I change the number of sequences, it drops out the samples that have fewer sequences than that. So, so if, we had just five, uh, if we had just five samples per subject and uh, 1,200 sequences per sample, for example, and I run that, uh, again, you can just get uh, very rapidly get a sense of how clear the patterns are, uh, separating the different metadata categories that you have. And so, for example, uh, in, in this case, if I have a lot more sequences, uh, but I have a lot fewer subjects, um, what, what you can see is uh, that, that there's still this nice separation between the subjects, although uh, it's harder to convince yourself of that pattern uh, with just a few samples per subject than it was when you had a lot of samples per subject, right? And so, so this, so this really helps you uh, balance those trade-offs where you have a fixed budget, uh, so you can collect a certain number of sequences total. How should I allocate that budget between, uh, in, in this case, different samples and then different depths of sequencing per sample? And so, um, and so the next step in this is to be able to uh, to, to run it a whole lot of times, um, and ask what fraction of the time uh, do I recapture the result that I'm trying to see? By what fraction of the time do I see the distance between subjects uh, being greater than the distance within an individual subject? So, uh, so one, one of the reasons why this is really important um, is, uh, is is when you um, when when you start uh, trying to look at the effect size of, of, of different uh, of different variables. 
So, um, so what, what I'm showing you here is the Human Microbiome Project data. Um, so this is, this is all the 16S from the, from the HMP classified by body site. And uh, if, if we look at, for example, the feces uh, versus the saliva uh, versus the skin, um, you can see those being very different from one another. Uh, so, so this is another analysis Antonio put together before ASM. Um, and uh, what, what's, what's especially interesting about this is that we're actually looking at two um, uh, we're, we're actually looking at two different primer sets and uh, and a few clinical studies. So uh, so for example um, so for example if I show you the, uh, the the HMP data collected with the B1 through B3 primers and the B3 through uh, B5 primers, uh, what you can see is that the overlay is pretty good, right? So you get so you get essentially the same overall pattern no matter which primers you use at the level of, the, uh, at the level of these differences between body sites. Uh, now one thing you have to remember about that is that these differences between body sites are not subtle, right? So the difference between what's on your hand and what's in your tongue, what's on your tongue is like the difference between what's in soil and what's in seawater. They're completely distinct and non-overlapping communities for the most part. So, um, so, so what happens if we just zoom in on one particular body site, like if we look at the feces alone, um, so, uh, so what, what we're doing now is uh, so what, what we're doing now is we're looking at um, fecal samples versus mucosal samples versus tissue samples, and, um, and so what happens if I rotate this around uh, is you can see that there's these two very distinct clusters. Um, so although although on average uh, you have a difference between the feces um, and, and the mucus from the tissue, uh, you still get this very distinct clustering, and you might be a little concerned about what that uh, what that clustering is. And uh, again, um, again, what we're seeing there, uh, if I color my project name, um, what, what you can see very clearly is that we're seeing that separation between the B1 uh, through 3 and the B3 through 5 primers, right? And then we have some other studies where, uh, where those studies, including one of diabetics and one of IBD, uh, what those are doing is they're just clustering along with the other samples that were collected using the same primer set, right? So in this case, what we can see is that the technical variability uh, that's introduced by the different primers, although it's not bigger than the biological variability between different body sites, uh, it is bigger than the biological variability between, between stool and what's on the mucosa directly. And it's also bigger than the variability between healthy and diseased subjects in the same study. Right, and so depending on what biological question you're using, um, this parameter, what primers you use, could be, uh, it could be critical or it could be not that important. And then the same is true for all of the other sources of variability that we discussed yesterday, right? So the DNA extraction method is going to affect your results to some extent. Um, the, uh, the DNA polymerase you use is going to affect your results to some extent. Um, uh, there's, just all these, there's just all these steps along the pipeline that could, in principle, affect your results and will, in practice, affect them to some degree. Um, and, and, so, and so figuring out whether you should care about that variability or not, it requires two things, right? First, it requires you to know the effect size of what you're trying to discover. And that's a problem because we know so little about the built environment at this point that most of the effect sizes are unknown. Even in biomedical situations like the data I'm showing you here, we don't know what any of these effect sizes are yet, like what the average effect of having uh, Crohn's disease is, what the average effect of having diabetes is, and so forth. Uh, but then the second problem is unless you've captured that information and you have it stored uh, and you have it stored in the database or something, um, you can you can never find out whether the polymerase mattered more than the biological site you were looking at. Uh, you can never figure out if the DNA extraction method mattered more without doing the same controls over and over again. So capturing all the data in a systematic way lets you investigate these parameters really quickly. So, um, so, so with that, and uh, right, right. one question. So yeah, absolutely. That, I mean, there's no statistics that you're applying there. You're applying that qualitatively from this picture, but is that also part of something to, for people who are uninitiated to feel like they can feel confident in? Oh yeah, that's that's a great question. So thanks for bringing that up, Jason. So um, so I'm, I'm just showing you a picture here. Uh, the, the way the way you back it up with statistics is um, is, is to is, is to extract the distances that correspond um, to, to uh, samples within a group versus samples between groups, and um, then then you can do things like label permutation tests. And this is all implemented in Chime uh, already, but you can do it in other packages like like Primer or whatever with uh, with with Permanova. So, so basically, if you have a variable that you think is important, 
Um, you can measure the effect size by looking at the uh, looking at the distance between samples that have the same state of the variable versus samples that have a different state of the variable. Um, then you can do a permutation test where you destroy the association between the samples and the variable and ask is that difference statistically significant um, as well as asking uh, as, as well as asking uh, what, what is the effect size directly where a small effect might not be statistically significant. Um, the, the other thing you can do is you can use the supervised classification techniques like, like random forest for example and you can ask can I train a classifier that allows me to separate all of the samples that I, that I ran with say um, uh, uh, with say one tack versus another tack. Um, can I train a model where if I give it all the samples except one, can it predict which polymerase I used to run that last sample? Or could I predict whether that last sample came from a floor or a ceiling or that kind of thing? And so if, if, the, if the predictive model is able to reliably classify uh, samples that you left out of the training set, uh, then again you know there's enough information in the data set to classify by that variable. Does that make sense? So, um, so what, what, I'm sh what I'm showing you is pictures, but there are statistical techniques that you'll, that you'll need to use if you want any of this to get through peer review, obviously. Um, okay, so, um, so, so how, how, how the metadata works in the database, um, and um, so, uh, so, so, so basically, um, I realize the uh, I realize the risk I'm running trying this again, um, but yes, the, the the internet is uh, the internet is definitely better in here than it was yesterday, um, which is which is not which is not the specific reason why they put us on this room, but uh, you know we'll uh, take what benefits we can get. Uh, sorry, what was that? It's for the margaritas. Uh, absolutely. Well, I was, I was fascinated that the sign out there indicates that happy hour starts at four because our meeting of course goes till five. So, uh, <laughs> so, so, uh, so, so the last hour of the meeting might be a happy one, uh, <laughs> even if the demo turns out not to be so happy. Um, but we'll see. So, uh, so, so anyway, so, so basically, um, so, so currently the way the search mechanism works is that you, you basically have to know the names of the study you're looking for. And so what? Uh, so what, what I'm getting? And so most of these are organised by the uh, by, by the name of the uh, either the first author on the paper or the PI of the project. And so um, and, and so if we take something like that infant time series. Uh, so remember remember that's the data looking at the succession of microbial consortia uh, in this one infant um, over the over the first two and a half years of life. Uh, if we take that and we combine it with, for uh, for example with with a set of diverse mammals. Um, what, what you can see is that uh, what, what you can see is that there's a whole lot of these metadata fields, um, and, and then uh, and, and so so you can um, so, so basically uh, there's a lot of standard fields that are not directly relevant to this particular study. Like for example, the altitude is not particularly relevant to studies of say um, a development within one individual child, right? That's uh, that, that's um, in this case essentially at sea level the whole time. Uh, however, when you're combining across different studies, you could imagine that it might be very, very interesting to look at, say, uh, children in Tibet versus children, um, uh, children down at sea level, and see whether there's a difference in development caused by that variable. So one, one thing that's important to remember is that even if one of these metadata fields isn't particularly relevant in the context of your own study, it might turn out to be really interesting later on when you're combining with other studies. This is especially true for things like geographical coordinates, like latitude and longitude. It's very difficult to get people studying animals in one lab to record those kinds of parameters because they wonder how they could be relevant. But then it turns out that uh, if you're doing, say, drug metabolism uh, studies, um, what location, what animal facility you have your mice in can totally change the response to, uh, to, to a drug that you give them. So, so actually that geographic information turns out to be critical and uh, may, may very well have a microbial basis. So anyway, if we just grab all the metadata, uh, one, one thing, and uh, by, by the way, um, so the database is not yet published, but you can get access to it online. It's just www.microbio.me slash chime. And, uh, and, and then, um, then you can just sign up for an account. Uh, that's an automated process. Uh, um, what, what, we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to, we're trying to make sure that uh, as many of the studies uh, that we can get access to as possible, including all the HMP data, uh, winds up in the database so you can play around with it. Um, but anyway, for so, so for any of these fields, so so here for example, um, uh, I've, I've got age selected. Uh, what 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 you can do is you can just select a particular range of ages. 
Now, um, as, as I scroll down, you'll notice some funny things in here, right? So we've got some ages that are up around 370, 400. Um, so, so the issue is that in the infant time series, age was recorded in days, right? Whereas for most of the other studies, uh, we, we have age recorded in years. And so, uh, and so we have this additional field, age and years, where uh, what we've done is we've standardized that data across the different studies and converted it all into this common reference framework. And so, um, yeah. So in general, though, Yes, yeah, so, so in, in, in general, um, so, so in, in, in general what the standard specifies is that you have, um, you, you, have uh, you have a field and then you record the unit that the field was in. So uh, in a few cases, um, like, uh, like age, and year, age and years, we've, we've just converted it over. But you can see that we have an age field and then we have an age unit field where okay, uh, for different so studies. Okay, I didn't see the age. Yeah, and then, then, then the same is true for many of the other fields where there's, where there's uh, reasonable variation in the units that you might have measured. So, for example, for, for distances, uh, we've, we've required in the standard that everyone converts those into, um, in, into, into meters just as, a, uh, just as a method of standardization. But the, uh, but, but the, templates, um, the templates give you detailed guidance on uh, what the expected unit for each field is. So, so you can pick a particular range, or you can, um, or you can just select everything. But for example, if you want to grab a whole bunch of studies and then just pull out the skin, because you want to compare that with your indoor air or something like that, uh, you can you can do things like uh, just um, let's see. Uh, so, um, so, so you can you can do things like uh, pick out. I think that's the. Oh well, well, this the study only has um, theses in it, but you know you'd have you'd have something like uh, you'd, you'd have something like uh, a bunch of other entries there showing uh, showing skin and so forth, and you just pick out the one you wanted and grab all the data that uh, had had the value of the mesh data that you were looking for. Yes. Um, yes, yeah, so, so there's a standard template and you can add additional analysis fields. Okay. And uh, I think Doug will show you an example. Are you, are you going to show an example of uh, custom fields or just something that uh, matches the standard template? Okay. Uh, <coughs> we can certainly do that. I'll Great. Just pack it in during the demo. Uh, okay, cool. Sounds good. Um, so, uh, <coughs> so, so anyway, so, so, so basically, um, so, so basically, uh, like the point of this is to make it easy to grab stuff from a whole bunch of different studies. And uh, as I mentioned, it can do a bunch of uh, different things. I'm just going to show you the PKA plots in the interest of time. And Um, and so, uh, and, and so, so for any of these, what, it, what, what it's going to be doing is whatever, uh, whatever set of uh, whatever set of metadata fields you, you select, um, it's going to it's going to color the output according to that set of fields, uh, so that you can um, so you can very rapidly uh, so you can very rapidly uh, try out uh, different scenarios about what might be important, um, see visually whether you see clear clustering or not, um, and then in the cases where you do, you can move on to uh, looking for some statistical validation of those clusters. So, um, so, so while uh, so, so while while it's while it's doing this, I'll just um, I'll just say a little more about those uh, about those metadata standards. So, um, so again, these are standards uh, put together by the Genetic Standards Consortium, um, which uh, which um, both both Jack and I are on the on, on the board of. And uh, so, so, so the main so the main specifications that we're uh, asking people to use throughout the Sloan project. Uh, is, is the standard uh, minimum information about any sequence or MIXS. And then the specific uh, variant that applies to marker gene studies is MIMARX, uh, which includes some additional technical information like what primers did you use, uh, what gene sequence were you targeting, and that kind of thing. And so, uh, so this, this was published in Nature Biotech last year. And uh, basically the goal of this is to capture uh, per sample um, and per site information and also technical parameters that can, uh, that can explain the variation uh, in, the, in the data in a systematic way. So, uh, so basically the idea is that there's a bunch of these speci uh, specification projects. So MIGS was the first one, the minimum information about a genome sequence. Uh, then we had minimum information about a metagenomic sequence, uh, minim uh, minimum information about a marker gene sequence, and then uh, there's additional checklists that are being produced for things like metatranscriptomics, metaproteomics, and so forth. 
And so, uh, so the idea is that there's a whole bunch of shared descriptors um, that, that apply to all of these different, uh, all of these different types of analysis, and that includes things, uh, basic things like where did you get your sample from, uh, who was doing the project, um, uh, like uh, uh, what what type of investigation was it, uh, what is the name of the project, uh, how did you do the sequencing, and so forth. Um, and then there's a bunch of stuff that's specific to individual types of project. So for genome sequences, there's a whole lot of stuff on the assembly. Um, uh, how they were isolated from growing, um, how many uh, how many segments, how many chromosomes the, the genomes broken into, and all that kind of thing. Um, whereas, for example, for marker gene surveys, you need to know what the target gene was, which you do not need to know for, say, a metagenomic survey uh, where you're just collecting everything. Um, and then the other thing uh, is that we have these environment packages uh, that apply across all of these different uh, all of these different types of surveys. So, um, so when, when we when we wrote the Nature Biotech paper, there were a bunch of host associated ones, um, and, and then some things like air, soil, water, uh, wastewater, and so forth. Um, one one thing we're doing at the moment, and um, and Elizabeth Glass and Lynn Schrimmel uh, at um, at Argonne and at the University of Maryland, respectively, are really leading this effort. Uh, is doing an extension of this specifically for the built environment. Uh, so this, this paper is in review at Genome Biology at the moment, um, although, the, um, uh, although the packages uh, are starting to be used uh, already, and we'd definitely, we're, we're definitely uh, be very interested in feedback from this group on um, whether those packages are uh, in, encoding the right information uh, for what we need to collect. Um, but basi basically the idea is that this is, uh, that this is specific for built environment work and uh, allows us to capture a lot more of the information about, for example, um, the, uh, the, individual, uh, the individual material that's being collected, uh, the, the room within the building, uh, the building as a whole, the site, and different levels of data that you might need to, that you might even need to encode. And if anyone's interested in a, uh, in a copy of this, uh, um, I'm, sure, I'm sure Lynn would be delighted to send it to you. Um, so, so where, where can you find this information? Uh, and it looks like uh, the, okay, so this is finished, so I'll just, uh, I'll just, um, oops, that's not the one I wanted. Um, let's see, I'll just start that loading. Um, that'll take a few seconds. Um, so, uh, so, so if you're if, if you're looking for the checklist, uh, the, the Genomic Standards Consortium site is www.gnsc.org, uh, and um, so uh, so if you look into projects, um, so uh, MIXS has, uh, has has the has, has the overall information about. Um, has, has the overall information about uh, how, um, like how to, how to be compliant with it, uh, who's adopting it, who you should uh, request help, uh, help for, and so on. And um, then, uh, and, and then uh, if we look at the, so, um, so, so what, what, what you can see is basically the, the checklists that are available. And then if you want, um, so, so then, uh, the, the, so then this individual uh, spreadsheets, um, both, both for uh, MIGs and MIMS, which have the information about genome and metagenomic sequences, uh, and, uh, and, and for MIMARCs. And so, so you can download these checklists from the, from the GSC website. And uh, if I open up that checklist, uh, which is just an Excel file, um, what, 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 you can, what, what you can see is that the first page uh, is, is basically commentary about the checklist and, uh, and uh, is, is telling you about the content. And then, then if you scroll down, um, the, there's all of these different fields where, uh, where, where, we have, we have, uh, the, where we have the name of the item, uh, and then we have a definition of what the item is. And uh, as, as, as you can see, there's a fairly, um, so, so, what, so what we're looking at here uh, is, is just the stuff that's common um, uh, that, that's common to the standard, and uh, if I show you the environmental packages, uh, again there's some commentary at the beginning, and then um, and then you can see that for example for, for air you might you might uh, include things like the oxygen content, um, the uh, storage duration of location, uh, the ventilation rate, ventilation type, uh, VOC, uh, uh, VOC concentration, and so forth. And uh, if I scroll down, uh, what, what you can see is that there's a whole lot of these, right? So, um, so the full standard uh, it contains something like uh, something like 600 fields, um, 
uh, so, so about 650 fields, not all of which are going to be relevant to your study. And so one, one thing we do in the context of the database is uh, let you select out uh, particular subsets of, of all of these environment fields that are relevant uh, both to your particular study and also uh, likely to be relevant across the project um, where, where those fields are required. And then it'll make a template that's specific to that that you can fill in for all your samples. Uh, the, the other issue with this is that, um, is that you need to fill in all of the stuff for each sample, whereas often it's more convenient to uh, have, have these things as column headers and then fill in each sample as a row. And so the spreadsheets we produce allow you to do that. Um, okay, so, uh, so, so going, back, going back to the demo, um, what, 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 you, what you can see here, and so what we're, what we're looking at here is uh, just asking this, um, this uh, very simple but kind of interesting question about whether the differences in the gut samples over the course of development of one person are larger than or different than the differences between different species. And so what, what, what you can see here is this, very, um, is, is this nice gradient in color. And uh, so there's a bunch of samples where we don't know the age, which is true for most of the zoo animals. Right, but for the, for the ones where we do know the age, you can see this very nice gradient going from red to blue, uh, which is very consistent with what I showed you the other day with this, re with, with this consistent gradient of development. And um, so, so you can tell that age is important. Now, uh, if I scroll down and I show you, for example, uh, the common name of, uh, of, of, each of, the, uh, of, the, of each of the animals, um, what, what you can see is that the human samples are, are, actually, uh, are actually occupying a really, uh, a really large fraction of the space. Right? And so what, what's, what's interesting about this is the process of, of development. And remember that these were at one end of the age gradient, one end of the age gradient and these were at the other. Uh, basically what we're seeing is that over this process of development, um, what we're seeing is that, that one individual is traversing a space that's much larger uh, than the difference between two, adult, uh, between two adults of even very different species. So for example, um, so, so, for example, uh, um, so, so for example, looking at say a squirrel versus a kangaroo, right? Um, so, so, so what, what what you can get an idea of is pretty much immediately uh, what what is the relative effect size of these different processes that are going on, and um, and, and in many environments, not just not just the built uh, not just a built environment, uh, the the actual sizes of the effects are very surprising and uh, not at all what we expected. And that's why it's a really good idea to be able to integrate data from a whole lot of different sources, not necessarily just the ones that you expect. And why it's really important that you have all the information in, in one place so that you can <coughs> combine things, uh, even if you didn't think initially that they would be relevant, um, to bring them into the study and see, uh, and, and see whether uh, you, you have a lot of microbial sharing with what you're trying to do, um, uh, whether, uh, whether you have potential sources for some of the microbes that are in your system. Um, okay, so, uh, so so I'm going to uh, so so, um, so 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 I'm going to leave this uh, so I'm going to leave this here. Um, Doug's going to do a demo of how you actually uh, upload stuff to the database. But before we switch over to that, uh, does anyone have any questions at this point? Okay, uh, great. So Doug.